So thank you all for joining us today. So this is the fifth season for IGCP 648, the virtual seminar series. So I'm Luc Doucet, I'm your host to, tonight. And today we are having Mr. Uh, Chi Huang Bao, a PhD candidate at the University of California, Los Angeles in the USA, presenting uh, what I think was published recently in, in Science, if, if I'm correct. Um, so the title is are hotspots hotter than ridge, ridges? So that's a very, very interesting paper. So um, our guest tonight is uh, got his uh, Bachelor degree of Science in Geophysics at the University of Science and Technology of China. Uh, he's now a PhD can candidate in Geophysics at the University of California, as I said, and he's interested in studying geodynamics of the deep Earth interior and the surface expression with experimental, computational and surrogate approaches. His research, his research, sorry, focuses on the relationship between plumes, LSVP, laboratory ex experiment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, I think we're good to go. So the audience is all yours. All right. Thank you so much for this um, wonderful introduction. And it's my great honor to have this opportunity to present my work at the um, IGCP 648 seminar. So um, as you can see from this background here, um, here shows a lava flow entering the ocean from the Kilua on the Hawaiian Big Island. Many of you might be familiar with the fact that um, this volcano eruption is not the same volcanic process as most of the volcanism on Earth is formed. Okay. Uh, all right. So the majority of the volcanism happens at Mid-Ocean Ridge, an arc, uh, as you can see from this map. Um, okay. It's not moving. Uh, okay, so, but there is also some interpolate volcanisms like Hawaii. So, what causes distribution of uh, volcanoes? The arc volcanism is the result of subduction. So, uh, which is part of this convective system uh, that with the mantle flow, the plate motion, and similarly, this large scale uh, upwelling and mid ocean ridge. Uh, at least to the hydrothermal vents. Uh, therefore, this large scale convection represented by plate motion, downwelling at slabs, uh, upwelling at ridges, is responsible for the most of the Earth's volcanism. But uh, there are also other, other scares of the flow that relate to the dynamics we want. For example, uh, the small scale flow that give rise to this um, volcanic hotspots represented by mantle plumes which might be from the steep mantle. The lava samples uh, at the different types of volcanism like Middle Ocean Ridge and um, uh, hotspots, that will be different and reflecting their source region. Therefore, hotspots give us a um, ability to look at the interior, both at the temperature and the composition. So it is a unique window to the geochemical evolution of the mantle. Um, to keep us on the same page, let's step back and look at what I mean by the difference in composition. The majority of the volcanism is generated by the decompression melting at the, the passive upwelling and mid ocean ridge. Uh, there are also some interplated volcanism away from ridges, which are hotspots. Lithologically, they're actually similar because they both produce basalt, either ocean island basalt or mid ocean ridge basalt. But OIB has some trace element characteristics that are different, which suggests a different origin for hotspots. And they may be connected to a deep source in the mantle via active upwelling, or we call it mantle bloom. Um, for example, uh, it could be connected to something like so-called large low shear velocity provinces as the lowermost mantle and shown in yellow here. This uh, passive upwelling that feeds the middle ocean ridge originates from the depleted upper mantle. Depleted means lack of incompatible elements in the levels due to melting. The ridge thus reflects the average uh, large region of the ambient mantle. And on the other hand, the source of plumes is suggested to be enriched based on geochemical studies. So what is the major element composition of MORB and OIB? Uh, here is a ternary diagram of the major element composition of MORB and OIB show in the space of uh, sodium, potassium, iron, and magnesium oxide space. Uh, you can see that the Hawaiian uh, OIB shown as solid circles, they have a very similar composition 
as the mid-Atlantic uh, morph shown as the cross. So um, this is not very diagnostic of their source region because of this large overlap. And you know, in principle, they're just the same rock. Uh, we can actually look at other non-major elements like trace elements and isotopic ratios. And among them, helium is actually the lightest diagnostic trace element. And one of the initial signal is actually high helium-3 to helium-4 ratio. Here, MORP in blue shows low and very tight helium distribution, but OIB from hotspots in red can ex exhibit very high helium ratio. And this broad distribution suggests uh, the hotspot source regions are much more diverse. And high helium ratio is also an indication of uh, primordial materials. By primordial, I mean first they're Asian, and second, they're like untouched and they're not mixed into the convection in, in the geological time scale. Sorry, time scale. Um, so um, helium, the, the high helium, the primordial source is also suggested to be dense because people find this um, positive correlation between the helium ratio and the buoyancy flux. Uh, this buoyancy flux is just a measure of the strength of the plumes. Um, you might wonder, what do I mean by this geometrical buoyancy flux? Uh, imagine that what do you need for materials to rise in the mantle? You need buoyancy, which will depend on volume and density contrast. Um, there are different ways to define this buoyancy flux, and here this geometrical buoyancy flux is uh, basically dependent on first uh, volume flux Q, uh, which is determined by the cross-sectional area A and the play velocity V. Here I'm just showing you the example of Hawaii. At the top is showing the cross section of uh, the largest big island of Hawaii, the most recent erupted uh, volcano, uh, the, the large seamounts. And also below I'm showing you the map view and also the plate velocity. And we would also need the density contrast delta rho, which is the difference between the density of mantle and that of water. Um, so with this, we can now get the points of flux and this strength measure of outpolling. And what does it mean if we have high strengths? Presumably, to actively rise through the mantle, you would have smaller density. And that implies it has to be either hotter or the material itself is lighter. So let's examine in the context of this um, convection, the null hypothesis that um, the material is hotter than the surroundings. So how can we determine that? Um, we're going to infer the axis temperature of the mantle beneath hotspots uh, with respect to that of the ambient mantle, which will be uh, estimated by the mantle beneath the mid ocean ridge, because ridge let us know what we think the integration over a large portion of the mantle. So to explain this uh, more thoroughly, let's look at this geotherm. Here I'm showing you the temperature at different depths, and also it's just pressure. Um, for a uh, normal oceanic plate, you would have a geosum that consists of two parts. One of them is the conductive part in the lithosphere, and one of them is the adiabats, the, conduct uh, the convective part in the underlying mantle. So we can follow this adiabatic part, uh, as the dash line shown here, all the way to the surface. And this projected value is called the potential temperature, or TP. And uh, this actually gives us a standard measure of temperature at depths. The geotherm at ridges uh, shown in green, uh, it represents you know, the ambient mantle. So uh, the adiabatic part is the same, but it's uh, just uh, translates, I mean, it transitions to the, um, the uh, conductive part uh, at a shallow depth because uh, the mantle here is just uh, goes to a shallow depth it's because the lithosphere is thinner. Uh, as a result, if you just project uh, the temperature of middle ocean ridge to the surface along the adiabats, your potential temperature will be the same as that of the ambient mantle. Uh, however, the potential temperature at plumes uh, will be different because the, the convective part, the adiabat, would be hotter. And with that, the projected value of potential temperature will be hotter. And the difference of potential temperature of plume with respect to that of the ridge 
will be the excess temperature, or TEX. Um, so do we have any data on excess temperature? Uh, the one possibility, and probably the most straightforward way, is to look at lava samples, uh, more and OIB, because uh, they give us a sense what the excess temperature might be, and they are representative of the melting processes that form them. Uh, this is basically the petrological thermometer, and a common one is called olivine geothermometer. Uh, it's based on the magnesium ion exchange between olivine and melt. Uh, here I'm showing an example from Curiero. Uh, it is basically uh, a collection of data published at the time in the literature of all the petrological thermometers. And they divide them into uh, three groups, ridges, rich influence hotspots, and hotspots. Um, and I'm showing you the potential temperature, the average, and their one sigma. So you can see this increasing order of temperature from ridges to ridge influence hotspots and then hotspots. And uh, basically, obviously, you can see that this hotspots, they are on average about 100 degrees C hotter than ridges. So uh, the typical excess temperature estimated by petrological thermometers is about 100 degrees to 300 degrees C, uh, which happens to agree with the dynamical limits for classical mental plumes, which it has to be more than either 100 or 150 degrees C. Uh, this dynamical limit, it is determined by uh, uh, let the plume rise fast enough and does not lose too much heat. Otherwise, you cannot produce uh, enough uh, melt at the lithosphere. So we will talk about more about this uh, later. And uh, But there are some caveats about the petrological thermometer. Uh, so, First, uh, they are actually affected by the melting processes and the fractionation. It's very complicated and it requires very careful treatment. And that's what, uh, why part of the reason you can see this inconsistency of estimates of excess temperature of hot spots in different geological studies. And second, uh, they are sample based. So uh, with that, we have very limited coverage of hotspots, no more than uh, half of the hotspots we have. And finally, uh, the samples are from shallow depths. They're typically above 250 kilometers, or that's equivalent to about a GPA. So with that, there is no deeper temperature estimates available. And can we do better than that? There's, is there any uh, other possible way to do it? Um, think about, uh, how can we get a global cap coverage for the all the hotspots and ridges, as, as you can see here, uh, squares, hotspots, triangles, ridges. Um, so is there any way that doesn't rely on this petrological samples? Well, one thing we can do is to use seismology. Uh, here I'm showing you a, a model from Berkeley. It's called uh, SAM-UCB. It's basically a, uh, a model that's uh, based on shear wave velocity and it's uh, coveraging, uh, it's covering from the surface and all the way to the core metal boundary. On the left, I'm showing you this uh, horizontal slices, uh, uh, red for this uh, slow velocity and blue for the fast velocity. The screen dots are just uh, global hotspots and the black lines are play boundaries, including the mid ocean ridges. On the right, I'm showing you these um, vertical cross sections for some selected hotspots. So uh, we can easily get velocity for any given point at any given depth with a seismic global seismic uh, tomography like this. And you might ask, what does the seismic velocity depend on? Um, it basically depends on the temperature, the pressure, the composition, the phase, and so on. But uh, to convert velocity to temperature, we would need some thermodynamic model. And uh, our primary focus in this talk is temperature and composition because it let us determine that our um, uh, two hypotheses is either hotter plume or it's a lighter material. So uh, there is a recent study from Dalton et al. They tried to uh, find the geophysical connection between the, the seismic velocity seen in tomography and either the temperature or their composition. So here on the left, I'm showing you that um, they find the data points for the more shown as the, the gray dots. They can be explained well by this uh, temperature variation alone. 
in the space of uh, shear velocity and the major element composition. Sodium 90 is just some correction to some standard. Uh, instead, if you use a composition alone, you can't explain it as shown by this uh, two horizontal lines. So with that, they assume that the, um, the mantle that feeds the middle ocean ridge is just homogeneous and consists of um, pyrolite or depleted more mantle only. And they can uh, infer the potential temperature for, a for, for all the middle ocean ridges at a particular depth. And uh, this is what they can get. Uh, red for hot and blue for cold. And you might also notice that uh, there is a hemispherical difference, that the Pacific regions tend to be hotter than the majority of those in the African region. And we'll go back to that in the end. Um, so with this kind of results, we're kind of inspired, and I would like to take a step further, expand this conversion, not just for ridges, but also for hotspots. For hot spots. And uh, we'll try to infer the temperature systematically for the entire upper mantle, not just at a particular depth. So here, again, I'm showing you my entire hotspot and ridge catalog, uh, squares for hotspots, triangle for ridges. They're in red if they're close to each other, meaning they're within a thousand kilometer uh, distance on the surface. Otherwise, they're in blue. Uh, there are also some continental hotspots in brown, uh, we also infer the temperature, but we don't include it in this study to avoid complicated tectonic settings in the interpretation. Now, recall Dalton's approach. We need to choose some um, seismic tomography to, be, to begin with. Uh, we would like to use global model, like the same USB model we showed, so we can cover as many hotspots as possible, and also mid ocean ridges. And we're going to focus on shear wave velocity models because uh, compared to bulk modulus, shear modulus is more sensitive to the temperature. And we're going to use multiple seismic models because we have different data sets and different methods. So it's not biased. And uh, with different models, we still focus on a particular model uh, which with full wave inversion because uh, with this type of method, you have more information as constrained and you will have less damping in your inverted uh, shear velocity perturbation. And this is very important because uh, we mostly rely on this shear velocity perturbation to determine our uh, axis temperature. So the better, uh, the less damping we can get, uh, the, there is a higher chance for us to invert for the uh, more accurate uh, potential temperature and axis temperature. Uh, however, with a large damping in principle, the amplitude of velocity of any tomography model will be a lower bound, not an upper bound. So uh, this is a very important decision. And in addition to that, uh, we will still have some damping in the best model available. So can we do some simple correction for the damping, considering that uh, the wavelengths of the uh, seismic tomography and also we have some plume characteristic plume widths uh, in our uh, classical plume and a mental plume theory. So we have, as I said, we have five seismic tomography models, but we focus on semi-USB, as I showed before, uh, because it's a four-wave inversion model. Uh, this is just showing you a horizontal slice at 300 kilometers. Uh, again, red for slow, uh, blue for uh, fast as the shear velocity perturbation. And uh, on the right, I'm showing you this uh, synthetic test, one of them we did. Uh, basically, if you have a synthetic plume with a peak velocity perturbation uh, amplitude of 2%, your recovered uh, velocity perturbation will be something like 1.2. And with that, we decided to scale up the velocity perturbation by 2 for all the hotspots by default. But we don't do that for the ridges. So how am I going to extract the velocity um, specifically? Here, this schematic, it shows uh, that uh, hotspots and ridges and uh, their distance on the surface is A, as I explained before. And our goal is to find the maximum excess temperature possible for hotspots. So to extract velocity, I need to find plume center for hotspots. And I will find the minimum velocity in the circle centered at the hotspots with a search radius of about uh, 500 kilometers on the surface, which will decrease with depth to account for the shrinking volume of the mantle. And 
with this large radius, uh, we have some redundancy. So we have uh, the ability to cover both the deflection of the plume due to mental wind and also the possible offset between the most re recent re erupted volcano and also the head of the mental plume. However, for ridges, uh, there are broad features. I said, as I said, they represent a large volume. So we just want to get the ambient mental temperature around it. As a result, we just uh, average their temperature in the same disk instead of picking the largest temperature or the smallest uh, shear velocity. So uh, I want to emphasize that uh, our choice is uh, trying to do everything possible to maximize the excess temperature and to provide very conservative estimates, meaning we're uh, get, trying to get as large excess temperature as possible. So uh, in particular, we um, choose to use the minimum shear velocity probation for hotspots, but average for ridges in the cone or the disks. And with that choice, we also may sample uh, some hottest nearby anomaly that's uh, not associated with this particular hotspots. And we may overestimate the hotspot temperature under certain cases. For example, if you have uh, another hotter plume nearby, but not associated with this hotspot, the uh, extractive velocity will be, you know, belong to that hotter plume instead. Again, we, uh, we scale, scale up the shear velocity amplitude by the same factor two for all hotspots. But we know that uh, in seismic tomography, the, uh, the um, damping of the um, amplitude actually depends on the data coverage. And two is a very conservative uh, bound. And with that, we are overestimating the uh, excess temperature for strong plumes. And we will uh, emphasize on this when I show the results later. So uh, how am I going to convert the extracted velocity uh, to temperature? Here I'm showing you this uh, shear velocity at different depths. Uh, red for hotspots, uh, blue for ridges, and uh, the thick line here is just a reference velocity uh, as zero uh, probation. So to con convert velocity to temperature, we have to use some uh, thermodynamic models. And uh, also, if, if you see that uh, hotspots in red, uh, they're hotter because uh, they're mostly hotter because of the lower uh, shear velocity and because of the higher inferred potential temperature. But look at how many red lines they overlap that with the um, the blue lines, which shows the middle ocean ridge. And we'll go back to this point later. Uh, in terms of this thermodynamic model. We use uh, Hefesto. It's a code that uh, self-consistently calculates the phase assemblage and physical properties of uh, at any given pressure and temperature based on the Gibbs free energy minimization and anisotropic generalization of the birch monogram equation of the state. So basically, it gives you a corresponding relationship between the temperature, uh, the composition, and also the phase pressure to the, uh, the shear velocity. And we assume uh, to begin with, the uh, the source that feeds the morb and the hotspots, they're just homogeneous and uh, they're just paralyzed or depleted morb mantle. And we will revisit this assumption in the later part of the talk presentation. Uh, we also uh, consider the attenuation because it will have non-negligible effects on the shear velocity. And uh, with all these um, choices we made, now we can finally convert my uh, velocity probation to temperature, as you can see below. And uh, again, there is a lot of overlap uh, between the hotspots in red and the ridges in blue. And we cannot tell what is going on here unless uh, we do something better. Uh, for example, to stack them together and look at some uh, useful statistics. And I'm going to stack the temperature from 260 kilometers and all the way to the 600 kilometers because uh, we want to avoid think, any possible effect of partial melt, as you can see here, the uh, uh, elevating inferred potential temperature uh, for uh, hotspot and ridges. So this is what I can get uh, with the stacking. Uh, those uh, violin columns 
they're basically are vertically plotted probability density functions or number densities. So the width here, it just shows the distribution at different potential temperature. Uh, the two column on the left is showing the hot spots that are uh, far and close to ridges, as I explained before. And the two on the right is ridges uh, that are close or far from hot spots. So uh, the first thing that might strike you is that uh, unlike Kuti et al, uh, for near ridge and far from ridge hotspots, their average temperature and their uh, distribution, they are basically identical. And for the ridges, again, the temperature is basically the same um, with respect to different proximity of hotspots. This is very interesting, but it does not mean that there is no plume ridge interaction. Uh, we can uh, go back to this in the end and uh, with some um, uh, further exploration. Uh, and also, uh, if you compare the hotspot and ridge potential temperature, uh, their average axis temperature is only about uh, 140 degrees C, which is just about enough if you compare to the dynamical limits. Uh, it's not 200, it's not 300, like the typical petrological thermometers. And also, there is a big chunk of the hotspot uh, the high number density part, it completely overlaps the temperature of ridges. Uh, this, this is very important because uh, this means the hotspots, they are not created equally. This is even more obvious if you look at individual hotspots. So here I'm showing you this uh, hotspots uh, sorted by their inferred excess temperature from left to right. And the dots in uh, red and in purple just uh, showing the previous petrological estimates. The two columns on the far right are ridges uh, in our study and in previous studies. So uh, first of all, if you focus on uh, the far right, uh, you can see that our um, ridge temperature is very consistent with all the previous petrological thermometers. So we are, we're sure that we have um, a good uh, baseline to work with. And secondly, if you look at um, how conservative our excess temperature possible are, because uh, if you compare our estimates, the average of each hotspot uh, shown by this uh, center line here, uh, compared to all the dots, the previous petrological estimates, we're actually overestimating for a lot of them. And that's because of our uh, decision. Uh, like, for example, we are scaling the axis temperature, uh, the scaling the shear velocity for all the hotspots with the same factor, which will overestimate for the strong plumes. And all the choices we make uh, made will make our arguments in terms of the axis temperature stronger. And next, uh, like I said, uh, the hotspots, they are not created equally. And how should we divide them by temperature? Uh, I have used a particular machine learning cluster analysis method called mean shift. So this mean shift clustering is essentially uh, something as a kernel density estimation. Imagine you have a two-dimensional distribution of data points like this, but obviously there are two clusters. If you focus on one of them and you start with some random guess of a searching window, then you can shift the window centroid based on the dots, the data points included in this window uh, if you calculate their average. So it's like gravity. You track the, uh, this window to the, the center of the current cluster and just move it iteratively. And if you find another window that's too close and they will be merged together. And with that, your um, uh, final position of this uh, searching window will be at the center at the uh, high density of the point, part of the points. And uh, what's amazing of the, about this method is that it does not need numbers of clusters to be specified because it will automatically determine how, num how many uh, clusters uh, we should have. That's very important for us because uh, we don't want to introduce some subjective um, classification like, okay, I want three groups, I want five groups. Instead, we want to do it objectively. So with mean shift, we can do that. And it automatically splits the hotspot into three groups. 
as you can see here, uh, hot for uh, uh, red and uh, warm for green, and also cold for blue. And this kind of uh, clustering is also actually consistent with your uh, humanizing. And we can further group this hotspots by this cluster. Uh, and I, I can show you on the right here. Uh, basically, for the hot and warm cold clusters, their average excess temperature is about 200 and 100, and actually below zero. Um, so note that this is actually the low end as uh, the patrological estimates. Uh, compared to the dynamical limit, as we talked about before, 100 to 150 degrees C, even the warm hotspots are barely hot enough to rise, not to mention the cold ones. And it's actually striking to see that uh, the, the cold hotspots, they have basically the same excess temperature as ridges. So maybe only the hot hotspots defeat the classical mental plume theory. And uh, also note that in our catalog, the hottest excess temperature uh, for each hotspot is still below 300 degrees C, uh, which is something like Bellany uh, uh, near the Antarctic. Okay, so I've shown what the hotspot temperature might be, but if hotspots, they are not hot, then how do they bring out materials, especially if they are dense? One way is to look at the geochemistry and the strength of plumes or the buoyancy flux. Uh, on the left, I groups the temperature for uh, high, medium, and low buoyancy flux based on 70% and 30% uh, of the buoyancy flux. And this column is just showing all the ridges. So for the plumes that do have significantly hotter excess temperature, uh, they do have hotter, uh, they do have higher buoyancy flux, uh, which means they're stronger. And also note that how close the mid and low buoyancy flux hotspots are in terms of excess temperature. And this uh, about 100 degrees C excess temperature, again, is barely enough for them to rise um, uh, actively, like a classic metal plume. So on the right panel, I do the same for helium, the helium 3 to helium 4 ratio. Uh, remember that high helium uh, is linked to the primordial reservoir that is untouched or being recycled by the large scale convection. And we have a similar result as buoyancy flux. Uh, hot hotspots tend to have high helium ratio, but for medium and low helium hotspots, they're barely hot enough to rise and they're, they have very close excess temperature. So uh, that means the hot hotspots, they are probably more primordial, which may be explained if their source region is dense, like the LSPs. And uh, these two are, you know, to some extent, uh, maybe connect to some uh, different uh, source region in the mantle. So what are the possible origin for the cold and possibly the warm hotspots? Here I'm listing a few mechanisms, but we haven't settled on any particular one. Uh, likely, I think it's more than one, another individual type. It could be linked to a shallow uh, source like passive uh, or edge-driven convection, small-scale convection, somebody's physical anomaly, or it will be still a deep process, a deep plume, but it's undergone additional processes, like it's traveling the convection, for example. But no matter what, they don't fit the classical mental plume theory. On the other hand, what is the possible origin for hot hotspots? In the last 25 years, there are growing studies suggest that they could be linked to a specific source, the LSPs. You know, uh, they're like above the core metal boundary, show here as the 1% uh, contour of a low shear velocity, uh, one beneath Africa, one beneath Pacific. Uh, and they can be as high as uh, 1,000 kilometers above, uh, above the core metal boundary. Uh, they are characterized by low shear velocity and sharp edges, and they are suggested to be an ideal um, a source for plumes because first, their geographical, co co uh, gra geographical correlation with hotspots, and also we think it's probably hotter and also denser than the ambient mantle, which is, which is kind of peculiar, so it could be explained if it's thermochemical. 
And with all that, people also suggest it's a possible reservoir for preserving primordial helium, because if you are dense, you can fight against the convection in the mantle. Uh, additionally, if we plot the geographical distribu distribution for hot, warm, and cold hotspots, shown in uh, red, green, and blue, uh, we can actually see, again, a hemispherical difference that uh, Pacific hotspots tend to be hotter than those in the African region. It's kind of mysterious. Uh, and we think it might be related to, for example, uh, the difference in the two LHPs, like the, the last IGCP um, talk. And also it could be linked to the, um, the supercontinental cycles. Uh, and I can expand on this if anyone is interested. Uh, and I forgot to mention that this white dashed line here is just showing you the um, minus 1% velocity perturbation. Basically, it's the outline of the LSPs. We also find the hotspots with detected uh, mega ultra low velocity zones, or ULVZs, uh, are the hottest in our results with an average existence temperature above 200, uh, 200 degrees C. And uh, this mega ULVZs, they are huge flat patches with very large shear velocity per, uh, reduction. And this reduction is enormous since uh, the peak-to-peak -peak difference of shear velocity uh, at the core mantle boundary is typically within 4%. But we have more than 20% here. This is something that you can't explain with temperature or composition alone, but rather you have to involve something like partial melt, which is very effective in reducing the um, seismic velocity. It has been further suggested to be the root of mantle plumes. And here I'm showing the example of Hawaii. So at least the hot hotspots, they may be in D from the lowermost mantle, and they're sourcing materials from regions like the LSPs and the mega ULVZs. We go back to our assumption that uh, the mantle is homogeneous beneath hotspots and ridges and consists of just deeply more mantle. But what if we consider a different composition for hotspots? A plausible uh, case is a recycled oceanic crust uh, or basalt or eclogite. People have postulated in this kind of uh, dynamic models that uh, the oceanic crust showing green, uh, they can be recycled uh, to the mantle because uh, they could be brought down by subducting slabs and they got delaminated because uh, they are denser because, uh, and they have some phase transition from basalt to a denser and a higher velocity phase of eclogite at a few kilometers. And that's why they can delaminate and they can be brought to the lowermost mantle and possibly entrained by the source of mantle plumes. Uh, again, the uh, color here is showing you the red for hot and blue for uh, cold. Uh, so in addition, uh, there are some pathological uh, sedative studies that suggest you can have up to 25%, which is a very high bound of uh, the eclogite entrained in the source of mental plumes. But, okay, maybe you have some hotspots or sampling eclogites that are faster, as shown on the left, the shear velocity at different depths, uh, blue for the pyrolite or DMM, uh, yellow for the salt or, or eclogite, if you have phase transition at different depths. Uh, you can see that they are indeed faster than the baseline, the, the pyrolite. Uh, so with a higher reference velocity, if you replace basalt, uh, replace power life by basalt, we would have a higher inferred axis temperature. But this comes with a great dynamical cost, as shown on the right, because the density of eclogite is much more higher than that of power life. This difference might not mean a lot to you, but actually in mental, 1% of density perturbation is enough to initiate convection. And we have 5% here we need to overcome. So it's enormous. Uh, so to measure these two competing effects, a higher excess temperature invert and a higher dynamical cost, we have to um, consider some dynamical limits that's based on the plume model. So here I'm using some uh, experiment, experimentally determined uh, velocity uh, with rising velocity for plumes, which is based on the density contrast the plume radius and uh, the 
uh, was viscosity of the metal. G is just a gravity, and K is some constant. So we find that, as shown in this chart, uh, with an increasing amount of uh, actinide in the plume source from zero to 25%, and a different density contrast, uh, we find to be neutrally buoyant, shown in blue. For example, you would need something like 368 degrees C for a 25% of actinide, which is something you can never reach. Uh, and if you want to rise with a typical uh, radius, 100 kilometers in green, you would need, for example, 138 degrees C excess temperature for a purely thermal plume, which is consistent with 100 to 150 degrees C previous uh, estimates. Uh, however, if you have a fatter radius, means you have a, a larger buoyancy, and, and also you have some uh, dense eclogite inside, this will be your uh, excess temperature, shown in uh, yellow. And for example, uh, I forgot to point out, for example, the 15% uh, eclogite, you would need something more than 300 degrees C, which is still hard to reach because uh, there's no such possible in our catalog. And also such excess temperature would produce enormous amount of partial melt on the surface, and that will result in a thick oceanic crust. So we find that with 25% of eclogite introduced in mental plume source, we will have 35 degrees C excess temperature increase, which is very small compared to the amount you need to be just neutrally buoyant, which is 368 degrees C. So cold hotspots cannot be explained by introducing a different composition, and they are robust. And we also can place a cap of the amount of recycled oceanic crust in the hottest and also the fat plume, which is 15%. And again, this is a very conservative bound. We think it's more like 12% or 10%. So to sum up, we find a half or more hotspots are not resolving hotter than ridges, and a high helium ratio, high buoyancy flux hotspots, they're hotter, much hotter than ridges, and they may sample the LSPs or mega UOVZs at the lowermost mantle, and the hotspots are not created equally. The cold hotspots and even warm ones, they cannot be explained by the classical mantle plume theory. And finally, we find eclogite introduced very strong buoyancy penalty, and plumes cannot carry too much recycled oceanic crust, for example, 15%. And this is not uh, appreciated enough in a lot of pathological uh, studies. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you.